takes it. He scored! Magnificent free kick from Collins. And Celtic get the reward for a wonderful first half performance. Again. Grant checks inside McCall. On for McStay. I remember walking across the park and thinking, well, I can't believe him going back here as a manager. Uh, after all these years, I looked up to the Celtic end and I looked to the Rangers end and the jungle and everything like that. And it was just, it was just like a dream. It was just a dream thinking, God, I can't believe I'm here as a manager of this, of this football club. Today, through Burns, he's in position now for Celtic. And a brilliant goal from Tommy Burns. Back to Grant, inside the Burns. A brilliant goal for Celtic. That's for Burns. That's a great goal for Celtic. That's Burns. That was magnificent. Aim for McGarvey. That's too long there. Tommy Burns. Twisting and turning. Great position for Celtic, there's Tommy Burns. And Celtic are two ahead. John McGarvey on the right, Nicholas on the left. Could this be the hat trick? The start from Tommy Burns. Right tackle. Burns. And there's the opening goal. Tommy Burns. In great intense enthusiasm, which he uh, applies very directly towards the job in hand, I think he is able to motivate the players and he transmits that enthusiasm to them. Uh, he has got s attracted some very good uh, assistance and, and supporting people in the, his coaching group and I think uh, he, he's able to impart to them the fact that there's an extra dimension to playing for Celtic and I think that is coming right through at the moment. You think that the, the club is probably virtually starting all over again? And they've got a new stadium to build, um, the, the, the squad of players that everybody kept telling me wasn't good enough. Hadn't won in for five years, six years, or whatever it was. Um, you suddenly realise that the expectations of people are all there now, and it's it's it's, it's fresh, and they'll still expect you to go and win everything because that's what Celtic supporters expect anyway. All taken quickly. Here's Peter Grant. That's intended for Joe Miller. A great interception by Goff. Stevens in trouble. There's Joe Miller. of the Celtic fans. So it goes right down the line. Billy Stark with the goal scorer. There he is, Joe Miller. He's scoring 41 minutes. Peter Grant holding a couple off. Then it's with Tommy Burns. I well, first started playing football in uh, Soho Street, which is just off the uh, Gallagate, which is no longer there at the moment. I think it's now become Crown Point Sports Centre. But that's where I first started kicking the ball about in the back court. Uh, football was always the, the main thing. It was always after school away for a game of football, lunchtime away for a game of football. We had three uh, midden cans at the back and uh, a ball. And that was it. We just, just made up sides and played among ourselves. And we just used the, the whole midden as the, as the goal. Uh, both sides of the, the back court. And uh, many a good cup final we played there. Uh, as, as I got older, the most important thing in my life became the fact that I wanted to be a football player. And it never dawned on me that outside there that there was other jobs like maybe a plumber or a joiner or, or whatever. 
Uh, nothing else mattered to me. I just thought, well, when I leave school, I'm going to be a football player. Uh, and I've been very, very fortunate. That's the way it's worked out. They played with the school, uh, St Mary's, and then uh, the Boys Guild came around about 10, 11 years old. They started a, a Boys Guild team. That was a, a man called John Rice. He was uh, very well known in the Calton area. It was, a, it was a tough area, but a lot of very good good people came from a lot of honest people. Um, some of the guys, I feel, maybe went the wrong road, but I think that was just down to circumstances as opposed to them being, being bad people. Uh, had it not been for John Rice at that time, I'd possibly have went the, the same road as, as many of them. He always kept in my mind, you know, you've got to get in there and you go to train and you know, work with the ball and practice and dedicate yourself and everything like that. And he was the guy who got me my first pair of football boots. The route to Celtic Park as manager was, with hindsight, almost inevitable. And he's quickly brought the smile back to the stadium and lifted the spirits of the staff. Good morning, Celtic. He's drawn on the influences of his youth. The man who became his manager in 1978 was Billy McNeil. He set himself um, very, uh, how shall I say, very strict standards and uh, achieved them. And uh, from a professional point of view, obviously gave himself a longer career than he might have had and certainly I think made himself a better player by so doing as well. It was one that I was always happy to have my team because he exuded passion, uh, he had loads and loads of ability, and as I say, he worked very much at his fitness. But I think the most important thing, he was a good leader and, uh, and, and he was a good personality in the dressing room, which is always important. The remarkable fact is that he came close to rejecting Celtic's initial signing offer and taking the route familiar in those days to many talented young Scots, to England. Inspired salesmanship within the stadium, changed all that. I'd only been playing with Mr Craig's maybe six weeks and he said, Ian came to me one day after, after a game and says, listen Celtic, well, why don't you go and train with him on a Tuesday night? So I thought, God, that's fantastic. I mean, I've only been here six weeks and why don't we go and train with Celtic? I said, oh, that'd be great. So I went up to, to Celtic Park and trained uh, and within maybe six weeks, uh, Wally Fernie, who was a, a great, great person and uh, he became a big influence on us at that time. Well, he was always giving me sticks, saying, you better get your haircut and everything like that. And then he came in one day and said, you get your haircut, he says, I'll get you signed here. So I was a bold man the next week, I went back in again. So I went up with John Rice and uh, my dad up to, to Celtic Park. And at that time, I mean, Celtic, as I say, were uh, European champions and they were qualifying for the, the later stages of Europe every year and everything like that. And it's, you know, and all of a sudden the whole enormity, the whole thing, I says, well, I'm, gonna, I'm 15 years old, I'm going to get in here and, and sign for Celtic. And he says, well, we're going to make it here. That was the thing that was right in the back of my mind. He said, it's okay, it's, you know, going in and signing an S form for somebody or whatever, but am I ever going to actually make it here? So I think I took a bit of panic at, at that stage and I said to my dad, oh, you, know, you know, Leeds United asked me to go in trials and Everton had asked me to go for trials and everything like that. I thought, maybe we'd be better go in there for trials first and see what actually happens. So I ended up, we said no to them. I said no to John Higgins, said no, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it. It was an old panic attack, thinking, oh, I'd never make it here anyway. So we left it, we're coming back up the, the foyer at Celtic Park. And for some strange reason, John Higgins, uh, another lovely man and a real true Celtic gentleman, uh, John says, look, have you seen the trophy room? And that was, that was the clinching thing. As soon as we went in there and seen everything, uh, and I mean, my, my father, God rest him, saying to me, he says, Thomas, you know what you're doing here? It's a Celtic you're saying not here. Uh, and I just, I thought about it, I says, oh, can't we can't walk away for you? Can't walk away for this, you know. So we shouted, "Join back in again," and back up into the room, signed the forms, uh, and that was me. That was me uh, and Ed Form signing myself like then. But uh, once I'd signed the thing, uh, I knew I'd done the right thing, and I knew that I would make it there because I knew I was going to give everything I possibly could until such times I did make it. And by making it, uh, that was never in my mind that making it with Celtic meant getting into the first team and playing a game or two games or whatever. Always for me, making it with Celtic was getting in there and staying there for as long as I possibly could and winning things as well. And win things he certainly did. Five Scottish Cup winners' medals, one League Cup winners' medal and six League Championships. Titles earned in the company of a host of great Celtic players. They helped to create League memories to savour.
Burns. Bowman trying to get back. Trying to work for one two with Wachlowski back to Proven. And that is finishing of the highest class. Davy Proven gives Celtic the lead. That's Con towards the far post. O'Connor's there, but so is Pat Bonner. That's Wachlowski, good ball to Burns. Frank Little's across. That's that little shuffle again. That is a marvellous goal from Charlie Nicholas. And look at the delight on the youngster's face. But the credit principally goes to Tommy Burns with that run on the left, the double shuffle getting him to the byline, and the cross leaving Nicholas to nod it home from the six-shot line, leaving John Brough once again totally stranded. It's Celtic's fourth penalty kick of the season. McCluskey scored two out of two so far. The only miss was by Charlie Nicholas. Here's McCluskey. One each. And George McCluskey leaving Jim Layton completely helpless. And Sullivan has the ball. Four man wall. McLeod waiting behind. There's McLeod. Deflection. And Layton is beaten. It's Martha McLeod who has given Celtic the lead. Short one, McCluskey. Mixed day. Oh, yes! Sheer brilliance from young Paul McStay. 13 minutes left. And young Paul McStay celebrates his Premier League debut with a goal to remember. Will he start? Playing it back to Fitzpatrick. And he's caught out by McLeod. Kenny wants it out in the right. But his aim for Burns. Now McCluskey. Oh, that's a great goal from Celtic. George McCluskey. And the Celtic bench coming out to join in the celebrations. That takes a great deal of the strain off. And what a marvellous goal it was. Great heat on the left. Beautiful piece of football. The build-up was quite superb, involving McLeod and McCluskey and Burns. And eventually it was George McCluskey striking it into the far post. McAdam got a free header. Now his goal is given. Yes, the goal is given. Lovely touch again from Burns. Now McCluskey. And that really clinches it all. Great move again from Celtic. And well might McCluskey celebrate. And now it's a procession. The man who started it all that time was Tommy Burns. Great piece of play going forward. The pass to McCluskey was perfection. And so was the finish, leaving Thompson completely helpless. And it's Charlie Nicholas trying to score his seventh penalty kick of the season. 1-0 to Celtic. David Proven twisting and turning. Great position for Celtic, there's Tommy Burns. And Celtic are two ahead. Of course, as we go into the final minute of the first half, Celtic still pressing for a goal, which would surely make the match secure. There's Proven. Trying to make room for the cross. He's made all right. Burns. Back across, and McGarvey makes it three. Well, it was all so simple in the end. The wing play again doing the damage for Celtic. Down goes Barnes, and that is a penalty kick. Grant against Ruff. Beautifully taken by Peter Grant. Robin Phoenix Day. As for Barnes. to McClare, Burns and McGarvey in the middle, there's McGarvey, and there's the opening goal. Frank McGarvey getting a 
his fifth goal of the season with just five minutes gone. McLeod now to McStay. It's Buns, McStay again. Absolutely magnificent. There's McLeod, playing it wide to McStay, he looked as though he might shoot with the left. The shot, the shot ball to Barnes, the return, and the finish leaving Walker helpless. Go on for Melrose, keying it up now for Barnes. And that's the part. near post and it's there well Roy Aiken gives Celtic the lead Burns takes it back from McGrain Reed has a lot of space in the left switch Beckett is trying to close down oh that's a giveaway to Frank McGarvey Rain being invited to switch the play by McAdam and obliging to find Mark Reed. Garvey surviving two challenges. McGrain to Sullivan. This is it for Nicholas. Tyler Nicholas makes it 4 0. McGrain. There's Young under pressure from McGarvey. Chance again for Frank McGarvey. That's the hat trick. Sullivan back to McGrain. Got him up to join in the attacking act. This is McCluskey. And that's goal number six. Still McGrain. Bonds in a forward position. by McStay, the chance is on for McGarvey, brilliantly struck by Frank McGarvey, there's Paul McStay again, Whitaker, Barnes, Celtic very patient now, they have the lead, there's Barnes going all the way, and that's a glorious second goal. It's very helpful to any young lad to come in the team. Uh, personally speaking, he was a big help to myself. Uh, let me settle into the team and uh, for the first couple of seasons, tried to help me through. But once I had my honeymoon period, uh, that was it. He let me know when I was <laughs> uh, not doing the right thing. And uh, I think that also helped us as well. There was very few players that I was ever in awe of. It wasn't that you didn't respect them, but there was a certain awe about certain people. I used to get a lift from Danny McGrain in the morning, who was the, the, the one exception in the dressing room where everybody was in awe of. But... Uh, the other one that I felt was Tommy Burns. I don't know why, but I always felt shy towards him. And whatever he had to say was worth listening to. Uh, I think it was probably my upbringing of watching Celtic and seeing Tommy. And I think everybody knows what he feels about Celtic, and he showed that as a player.
Yet five League Cup finals yielded only one winner's medal in 1982. No problem. Inside it goes. And Nicholas does it again. 22 minutes gone, Charlie Nicholas gives Celtic the lead right out of the blue. Another throw in from Redford to Fritz. Well won there by McStay for Danny Proven. Proven moving forward, just touching it sideways to Nicholas. And there's no one in the country more deadly. Beautifully struck for Nicholas with his 29th goal of the season. Gives Celtic a vital lead. Proven lucky to get a second bite at that. And Fritz concedes the corner kick. Proven's corner kick. Here's Aiken. Aiken came back to stay onside. Right across the far side. McAdam is there. McKinnon very determined. Vintage goal from Mother McLeod. This saver from McLeod, his 10th goal of the season, and seldom has one been enjoyed more. Right across by Proven, McKinnon came in at the far post, a good header down, McKinnon did well with this challenge, heading it out, and it fell to that powerful right foot of Mother McLeod, and just look at that for a finish. Well, Rangers will have to gamble everything and coming forward, they will have to guard against the danger of losing an early goal there's Gordon Smith brought down as he went forward by Tom McAdam McAdam protesting that Smith handled the ball although that certainly appeared to be an accident and it's a free kick to Rangers in a very dangerous position well, a goal at the stage would transform the match I'm sure Bonner lining up that huge Celtic wall Bet, Prince and Cooper are all around the ball. Referee Kenny Holt waving the wall further back. Cooper leaves it this time to Bet. Flight it in! <laughs> Bet does it and Rangers are back in the match. Marvellous free kick from Jim Bet. Rangers burying their free kick pattern brilliantly there. Well, here it is again. That wall is lined up. Cooper right over the top. There it was, he came forward, the delicate little chip into the top corner, and Bonner couldn't reach it. 90 minutes have come and gone. And Green takes the throw, and there goes the final whistle. Joy for Celtic manager Billy McNeil. Celtic have won the first domestic honour of the season. The Scottish League Cup throughout his career as Celtic manager. The only honour, Celtic manager has to get one in the Scottish League Cup, and there it is, held aloft by the captain, Danny McGrain. Uh, Tommy had the influence, uh, not just on the park, but off the park also. Um, you know, as a young boy in the team, there were so many. There was Danny McGrain, Tommy Burns, Roy Aiken, and that that I looked up to. Uh, but Tommy was the one guy that would uh, take you away and have a little quiet word in your ear and uh, we became great friends um, mm -hmm. and um, certainly he had undoubted talent, uh, tremendous ability on the ball, left peg uh, that could uh, make the ball talk really. Um, but I think off the park also he had a huge influence on everybody. I think most definitely the time you learn more about yourself was in adversity as opposed to when if everything in the garden's rosy and you're winning all the time I think you can be led down a different path where you think oh this is my divine right here, and I'm a good guy and a good player and deserve everything that's going. But I think you really learn a hell of a lot more about yourself when things are going against you. You know, but where your, your, your strength comes from, your faith, your character, whatever. Uh, and you find out all sorts of things about yourself when things are going against you. you whether you, you, you duck out of it or whether you stand up, even if you're having a hard time, you still get in there and say, oh, I don't care, I mean, if I'm in mistakes, I mean, I'm in here, I'm going to go and work hard and, and that's it. What you see is what you get with Tommy. It's uh, pure honesty and hard work. And he doesn't, he said it many times, he said he, he doesn't have a magic wand. But what he does command is uh, he commands respect because you know that his passion for the club is, is fully committed to it. 
And uh, I think you've seen that in the players. I don't think we've played, other than the Rangers game, particularly well for a long period of time in games. Patches were playing good and we're looking a bit more passionate about our game and a bit more pride and hungry. And that's Tommy Burns that's brought that. Uh, he's added with Billy Stark uh, a belief in the dressing room that seriously hard work and commitment and your passion for Celtic can get you results in games. And I think that showed. Tommy was only 20 years old when he won his first Scottish Cup winner's medal against Rangers in 1977. A tensely fought match was settled in the end by a penalty kick, coolly taken by Andy Lynch. It simply gave the young Burns a taste for more success. The 1980 final was a historic occasion, the first final to go to extra time at the end of the first 90 minutes. It was Rangers' fifth Scottish Cup final in succession. The year before, the final went to three matches after two nil-nil draws. This heralded the rule change which enabled the 1980 final to be settled at the first attempt in extra time. A Tom Forsyth clearing header landed at the feet of Danny McGrain and his shot, which appeared to be covered by Peter McCloy, was deflected home by George McCluskey. The cup was won again. It was collected proudly and impatiently by the man Tommy Burns considers the finest Celtic player of his era. Danny McGrain. But it's a United free kick. Back Bonner organising his defence. Milne flights it in. It was won by McAdam again as Hegarty closed in. Bannon to Malpass. There's Dodds. The way from Aiken. Inside to BD. 1 0 to United. Stuart BD. With 10 minutes of the second half gone. Well, what a tremendous goal. Now, just watch the contribution made here by Davy Dodds. Great control with the head, nudging the ball beyond Roy Aiken, turning, going away from the Celtic defender. Outside the foot, flicking it inside for BD. And he steered the ball beyond Bonner to open the final. Roy Aiken up with the attack. There's Mother McLeod, a shooting chance for McLeod. Got down by Bannon. Well, McLeod lost his first chance at the shot. Overrun the ball slightly, but he now has another chance outside the box. Jim McLean, the United manager, I'm sure, concerned about this situation. And Mother McLeod had a couple of opportunities here to have a shot at goal. Tried to create even more room and was brought down by Bannon. Now Celtic have McLeod and Proven who are deadly from this situation. They only want the goalkeeper to at least make a save here. They've got to get on target. And I fancy it may well be Proven. He's the man who can bend them from this situation. <laughs> Perfectly stopped by Proven. And that's the flash of inspiration Celtic required. 13 minutes from the end. Perfect free kick from Davy Proven. Well, this is one we'll see many times. A five-man wall, Proven taking it perfectly, curving the ball into the top corner, McAlpine with no chance at all. The head tennis, finishing with Hegarty's students, which oh. he can returns. The header from McGarvey! Yeah. Frank McGarvey, 2-1 to Celtic. McAlpine left without a hope. And this was Roy Aiken's contribution. Winning the ball on the right, now that's a marvellous cross. McGarvey in his own, flying at the ball. The header beating McAlpine comprehensively. So the cup being presented there to Danny McGrain. Tom McAdam, Ryan McClear, and the man who won the Mr. Superman Award, Roy Aiken, Pat Bonner, the Celtic goalkeeper. Tommy Burns, clearly delighted also, collecting his medal. And happily for United, Kevin Gallagher appears to be none the worse. 
Very good again. Test him now in his pace. Taking on Roy Aiken. There's Gallagher! It's a magnificent goal for Dundee United! Not well, intended for Miller, but it's found Rogan. Good play by Rogan. Equalizer by McAvenny. They're stuck. McAvenny. Frank McAvenny has won the cup for Celtic. So there is the moment the Celtic legions were hoping for. The captain Roy Aiken holds the Scottish Cup aloft. Celtic have won the double. Trying to take on Aiken. The Celtic captain wins it but concedes the throw. Well, no, indeed, it's a Celtic throw taken quickly. Here's Peter Grant. That's intended for Joe Miller. A great interception by Goff. Stevens in trouble. There's Joe Miller. Four minutes from half time. The celebrations begin on the Celtic bench. A dreadful error by Gary Stevens and Joe Miller puts Celtic ahead. No problem there, it would appear, for Gary Stevens and Miller wasted no time filling that behind Chris Woods. Well, oh, sure. what a disaster for Gary Stevens. Is that not the second time in the game that he's given a bad back pass? Gary Stevens, that was dreadful, wasn't it? I mean, the ball just stuck on the, on the grass here and set up for Joe Miller to slot in. A terrible mistake. Well, Gary Stevens will have to overcome that. What a terrible error to make in defence in a cup final. They're the scoreline now, Joe Miller's goal, putting something ahead. Here's Mark Walters. It's off the line by White. A miraculous stop on the line. Rangers hitting back instantly, and suddenly the cup final has come to life. The shot goes beyond Bonner. We fully expected that to go in. And Free kick now to Rangers, which David Cooper will take. Goff and Butcher waiting in the corner of the box. That's towards Goff. Back it goes to Walters. Bonner was down, it's hooked back in by McCoy. Up goes McCarthy. And there goes the final whistle. Celtic have won the cup. Typically, the first thoughts of Tommy Barnes and Peter Grant were for the Celtic supporters. The bow said it all for Barnes. And when Roy Aiken held the cup aloft, it signalled the end of Rangers' treble dream for the season. I, I like uh, that type of player. I like the Tommy Burns of this world because they show their emotions and they show their passions at times. And I think that uh, it's impossible, I think, in any professional sport and possibly in any profession, to, to have a nice, mild manner all the time. And I think everybody's got to, to let steam off. I was with a few major clashes, but uh, the, 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 the good thing about that was that uh, and something I learned now as a manager, uh, thinking back to then, was Big Billy never held it against you. You know, he, he could go and he could, he could come through you, and you could get back and get your, get your topmost worth in. But the next day we'd been and it'd be all about playing the game for Celtic again. That was that was the thing, uh, and that was something that uh, I greatly admired about him because it, I mean could, some of the things that happened between him and I, he could have put me out the door and nobody would have batted an eyelid. But I think he still thought that uh, no matter what I was saying or whatever, he still knew that uh, I wanted success for Celtic just as much as he did. He could be a bit hot-headed, you know, within himself. Didn't always show it. He always wanted the best for Celtic. Uh, and I think I said at the time, maybe wasn't the, the greatest Celtic player ever, but one of the, the all-time great Celts. Yet it was another of the all-time great Celts, Jock Steen, who had Tommy's international career in his gift as Scotland manager during the peak Burns years. But he largely chose to ignore him, on all but seven occasions. But his eighth cap was the most memorable, the last fixture against England at Wembley in 1988. He came over to Andy and I remember him putting his hand on his shoulder and saying, thanks very much, this means a great deal to me to play against England at Wembley. And on he went for the last 15 or 16 minutes. The memento cabinet within the entrance hall at Celtic Park is graced by Tommy's 1988 cap and jersey, donated after his departure from the club as a player and explained in his letter to Tom Grant. Tom, 
I enclose shirt and cap I received for game against England at Wembley, 1988. It means a lot to me, Tam, to have something of mine on display at Celtic Park. So many thanks, my friend, for thinking of me as worthy enough to have something of mine on display. Many thanks, Tam. Yours in Celtic always, Tommy Burns. We talk loosely about being a good professional, but if ever there was a good professional, it was Tommy Burns. He was thorough in everything, all his preparation. Late in 1989, Tommy made his last appearance as a Celtic player in a friendly match against Ajax of Amsterdam. Two days earlier, he had agreed to a transfer to Kilmarnock as player, later as manager. Big Billy said, look, look at this game coming up on uh, Wednesday against Ajax. He says, what we'll do is, he says, we'll put you in there and be the first half of the game or maybe the first half of an hour. He says, then we'll take you off. He says, that'll be you. He says, it'll be, be, be a good night for you. Which is very good then because they didn't need to do that. They didn't need to do that. There's a lot of managers which just say, no, you're away and forget it. But uh, that, was, that wasn't his way. It was to allow him to say cheerio to the fans. You know, when you've got a player who's been who's been very loyal to, to, to you and been very loyal to the, the team, I think it's important that he gets the opportunity to say goodbye to the fans, and particularly a club like Celtic. I think the relationship between players and the fans is very important. And I felt it was only right that uh, he, he was given that. And I think he appreciated that, and he certainly enjoyed the occasion anyway. The Celtic fans knew he was leaving. They wanted to say thanks. And a lot of people say, oh, you must have brought your heart going off. But I never broke my heart going off. I actually broke my heart on my own. And when I was doing the warm-up run about the part, the tears were just flooding in my face. And I just done all my crying before before the game actually started because I knew, I said, once it comes, you've got to go off. I don't want to leave in tears. And that was it. I just done all, done all my crying. I was running about the park, warming up, and we got into the jungle to try and get the ball out after it's been kicked in, and the supporters were all shouting, all the best, and God bless you, and everything like that. It was so, so emotional. Um, and then once the game started, I just played the game. And then the time came to come off and you know you suddenly realise that, uh, that these people have supported you for the last 17, 18 years and been so much part of your life. Uh, you wouldn't be playing in front of them anymore. The long journey from Soho Street to the Carlton district of Glasgow to the status of one of Celtic's great players was ending. But ending still with a reminder of the skills which had graced so many of the major football arenas of the world. A new career at Kilmarnock beckoned but this was a night of high emotion. If the Celtic supporters demonstrated their deep affection for one of their favourite players, the feeling was undoubtedly neutral. If Tommy Burns wasn't the greatest ever player to wear Celtic's colours, there has been none more committed and none more appreciative of the loyal backing from the jungle. From now on, the route to work would change, but only temporarily. For about a week after it, I can still, I can still remember, you know, crying every day, you know, travelling up and down the road, just still, still crying. And coming in here, and Rosemary, she wasn't any help to me. She'd be lying in the heat, greeting as well. Uh, just because it was so important, to, you know. And I'd been there since I was a boy, really, 15, and I left when I was 33. And all the lovely memories, the lovely people that I'd met there, the people that had supported us all the years, how, how special they'd become and are. And then all of a sudden it's, it ends. But uh, I think when you look at it, you think, well, this is just this is just life, and there's happened to other players as well. And you just go and go on, mate, and no change in your life. You're just grateful for the, the times ahead there. For Tommy Burns, it's a genuine return to paradise. This time with the immediate destiny of the club in his hands as manager. On match days, this is the referee's room, but during the week, it's where the preparation for training takes place. Wearing a tracksuit among the players on the training ground is where Tommy is happiest. I don't think people realise just how how far they had fallen. You know, it had been just another team basically. Uh, the only difference being with Celtic and any other team in the Premier League is the amount of people who go to support you. Uh, because as far as the playing side things goes, over the last few years it's been proved that uh, they're not any better. And as I say, the, the biggest difference from Celtic to any other club is the, the support. And it's important that uh, I keep saying that the players realise that as well. 
I think for so many years now that's been all uh, fragmented. And the supporters have had dances and they've had functions and everything like that. And players have failed to, to turn up there for whatever reason. They've failed to turn up and uh, with all sorts of excuses sent to people. People that pay their wages. Pay for them to live in these houses and drive in these cars, whether they like it or not. That's what they're the people that pay for it. And we cannot treat them with anything other than the greatest respect we possibly can. And if that means going out to a supporters function half a dozen times a year or ten times a year or twelve times a year, we'll never be better looked after. We'll never be better looked after in any company than what they will be in among Celtic supporters. The Lisbon Lions. For some, a spectre haunting the Celtic of today. For Tommy Burns, they were the heroes of his youth, an inspiration and a reminder of past glories he would like to emulate. Looking at the Lisbon Lions when I was maybe 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, they were the people that we wanted to emulate. We wanted to be the same, we wanted to win the European Cup, we wanted to win the leagues constantly, uh, win trophies consistently, as they done. Um, they, they, they will never be forgotten among the Celtic people anyway. I don't think they ever should be. I mean, I've got a fantastic life-size picture of Jimmy Johnson dribbling against Rangers up in, in my, my office at Celtic Park. Fantastic picture with Bob Lennart just running along in the background. And Because these were the people that were the, right at the very heart of the club and it was at its most exciting, at its best ever time. Uh, and that is a standard that we have got to try and get back to. And I know it looks a million miles away from now. At this stage, it looks as if I'm a million miles away from it. But I'm sure in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, it looked a million miles away for those people. And then all of a sudden it comes, and it gets there with hard, hard, hard work. And people that are committed to the people that support the club, and they want to go and give everything they possibly can to play for Celtic. And that is something that we want to make sure we get right through from the youngest guy, if they're 11, 12 training with Celtic, right through to the oldest player. Every one of them knows who they're playing for and what that, what that means. Packy, Packy, you can start them off there. Shooty, Cabs, you're in there against Paul McStay and John Collins. So you've got to work them. I don't uh, like to go into the, the, the training field and sort of give a philosophy to the players that, you know, this is the way it should be and don't care what any you say, this is it and this is the way it's going to be. I mean, I think uh, basically, I mean, I'm not that much older than a lot of the players that's there. And I can certainly let them have their, their point of view and their say or whatever. Um, but I've got my own ideas. Uh, Billy and I have got our own ideas of how we think the game should be played. Um, both when we've got the ball and when we've not got the ball. And it's basically just trying to put a bit of organisation into that, into the defensive side of things. Oh, Going forward, try to give them as many options as we can. Try to tell them uh, about the movement you're looking for when you're a successful team, all down to movement, how you move players about and everything. You know, there's no watching it and me drifting here and you're the forward, me drifting here and all of a sudden, you're in. Yeah, that's it. That's the difference. That's the difference. You know, taking up your position properly. Oh, Basically on the, 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 the training ground, I don't want the, the players to think that we're detached from them in any way, you know? Well, we're, in, we're in among them and it's, it's, it's no us in them, it's, it's, we're all together. We're all together and uh, we just want the best thing for Celtic Football Club and the best thing for the players because I mean, this is a group of players that's been much maligned um, and they'll, they'll, know, they'll know get any criticism from myself or, or Billy. Yeah, any time, no, no public, publicly anyway. They may get it behind closed doors, but it'll always stay behind closed doors and anything I've got to say to any of them, they'll stay behind closed doors. And it'll know be anything other than, than what I feel and what I think. Uh, and I'll know fall out with them and know we'll talk to them and banish them to the reserves and youth team and send them all over the country and all that because they played badly, because they don't do what I tell them or whatever. But we're not winning that, we basically just want players that will come in every day, train hard, um, conduct themselves properly um, and once the game start, go and give everything they possibly can every single time they play for Celtic. And there it's going. Yeah, OK. So you know where you're diving. Oh, get in there! I don't ever believe a word that I say, shooting. Yes! 
it's one of his major assets is that he's able to to relax and, and enjoy the the funnier side as well and I think uh, that stood him in good stead coming back here to work with players that, that uh, he had played alongside because uh, you know he can have a laugh and a joke with them but uh, they know when he's serious. We try I feel to, to encourage them as, as much as we can um, because I think people will always will always have that better to, to encouragement than they will to, to abuse. You know, although there are always times you've got to change and then let them know that you're no just going to keep kidding them along all the time. It's something you've got to turn and really let people know what you think about them. But equally, once you've told them that, that's not something you're going to hold against them or whatever. It's just that they're told f for the sake of the team and for themselves. And then they just go on with it. And if they can't handle that, then they're not going to be any good to us. As a teammate, I felt the rough edges tongue a few times and uh, probably gave as good as I got right enough. But, uh, you know, he was somebody that, that you know, Live for the moment and, and really, you know, was very intense about it. But as I say, you know, you'd come into the dressing room at half time and it would then turn into a, a cold, calculating discussion about things. And, uh, you know, if he felt that uh, you had made a fair point, then he, he stood up and, and uh, admitted to that. He's, he's restored things so quickly, uh, just be sheer honesty and his work. And I, I don't know anybody in our dressing room who doesn't enjoy the coming of work now. The biggest change has obviously been um, the introduction of uh, meals for the players uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. What they're getting is very high uh, carbohydrate food in the first hour after training, which is when all the sports nutritionists say that you know these uh, athletes should be taking it. Pastas, soups, different drinks, lots of bananas and Jaffa cakes. And, uh, I mean, it's a huge difference to them. I mean, all the coaching staff, you know, we all uh, would sit in and, you know, either at a table together, just spread amongst the players and have a chat. And it keeps them together longer, which is good for morale. Um, you know, you see the guys sitting and blethering and having a laugh and a carry on. And not only the first team that get this, it's the first team reserves plus the youths. And I think it's a case of introduce, introducing good um, habits early for these kids so they know what they should be eating and when they should be eating and hopefully eventually that that will pay off for them, more, even more so than the, the first team just now because, as I say, they've just started it. Nothing is more important to Tommy Barnes than his faith. In the morning before I go to, to training, I go to the, the 8 o'clock o'clock mass there. Uh, and I get a great deal of strength for that, and that's between eight and nine, and I can I can have the mass and uh, I can spend some time there talking to to Jesus or Mary or whoever it is I'm, I'm speaking to, um, just presenting the problems that may appear during the day, or may occur during the day, and put them to them, just asking to help me get through this and to help them to be uh, the remedy as opposed to something that's going to cause more problems. You know, be the remedy for something. And you know, so so many different things that happen during the day. And you just ask to, to get helped in every way, and just to be guided that you do the right thing because you're the leader of a fantastic football club, and thousands of people look to you for guidance for their football team and how you conduct yourself as a manager and everything like that. And if I was to take all that on myself and try and do that myself, I would never in a million years be able to do that. If I was trying to handle all this myself, but I can go and I can put all these things and just let. Like God, yeah, that's it. Just let him handle it, and I know he'll, he'll guide me through because he's, he's looked after me so well in my life. Um, and that's it, I just leave it to him. Just present the problems to him and say, look, this isn't right, or that's not right, can you help me with this, help me with that. Always, always, everything. And I'll, know I'll never go and do anything without speaking to him about it first. Anything at all. If it's football, handling people, anything, anything. I always just pray for guidance first so that I'll do the right thing. And to do the best job I can for Celtic Football Club. Because the people that support it deserve only the very best and sometimes I'm not wise enough to give them that. And I just pray for God that he'll give me the guidance to do it properly. The family group provides steadfastness and purpose. Daughters Emma and Jenna, sons Michael and Jonathan, and wife Rosemary, a regular at matches beside Nancy Stark, the wife of assistant manager Billy. 
They are well aware of Celtic's demands. The players now are, you know, they're competing every single game. And you know, that is the most important thing, to go and compete and really push yourself to the limit. Yet at the same time, you know, give them a sort of uh, Celtic outlook how, how we want the game to be played. You know, it's got to be played in the right areas quickly and it's, it's got to be done with a lot of flair and imagination. But, uh, all these things we can only put into to practice until such times you've got people there that can do that. Um, I think the most important thing for any manager is, is to go and do the best work you've got. The philosophy is just to go and compete in every game. Try and play as well as you possibly can in the game. And if you don't play particularly well, then make yourself very, very difficult to play against. Yes, Scotty, yes, Scotty. He realises it's, a, it's a, a big job, and even more so coming to a club like this. And uh, you know, I think he was very aware that he wanted a, a good staff round about him, and I think he's done that. And, and you know, he gives everybody there their, their place, and of course, he makes a final decision, which is only correct. The whole place has uh, got a buzz about it now. Everybody's enjoying uh, everything that's going on here. Even when he was young, he had, uh, he had a good idea of the game and he talked about the game uh, incessantly. And uh, when he got older, obviously, he put all his knowledge um, into his managerial, uh, his first job anyway. Um, he learned from the players, that was, or the managers really, that was around about him, and the senior players. He took everything in. Um, and I think that's the ingredient you need to be a manager. You've got to keep learning throughout your career. And hopefully when you do become a manager, you use all those little pointers to help you out. It was important we got somebody with, uh, who knew a bit about the game and who knew about Celtic. And uh, the most important thing, he came in, motivated the players, made the players believe in themselves. And uh, I think that was maybe the turning point. Uh, there's plenty of ability here and it just made the players believe in their own ability. We need somebody to come out towards the ball. He gets it here, peel off towards the ball, and then when he plays in here, that's you coming out to get it. And if the guy comes out where you can play him in, if he stays here, you've got plenty to go and make it happen. Five minutes in a row. Who made it? I did! I Come and show! Sit! Come on, get up, boy! Ha! Ha! Close that goal, man! Sit! Sit! Hold! I just feel it's a pity this season we're not actually playing at Celtic Park because I think it would have been even greater, the fact that we have to go somewhere else and play. Uh, took a little bit of time to adjust for the players and took a bit of time for the supporters to adjust. And I think if we would have been here at Celtic Park, we would have seen it even quicker because uh, it's always been a greater feeling here. The prospect of returning to Celtic's spiritual home is relished. A dream soon to turn to reality. The demolition work has taken place. The restoration of the stadium has begun. It remains a place full of history and tradition where heroic achievements have been witnessed and cherished. The jungle may have gone, but a million memories remain. This is how the finished stadium should appear. The biggest all-seater football stadium in Britain outside Wembley. To describe what Celtic means is, is to be there in, in front of a packed Hamden or a, a packed Celtic park and see them there with their scarves raised up. Uh, and incredibly, the, the most moving times for me have been when we've been getting beat. They just seem to stand there defiant right to the end, even long after the end games at Aberdeen where they sang for 20 minutes after we get beat. Uh, it's quite, quite amazing. It's, as I say, it's a whole, whole way of life for these people. And I'm very, very aware of how, how important that is in their lives. It's important to the paper boy that comes here and writes CFC on the back of my car when it's a frosty morning. And it's a wee woman that asks you to get a card signed for her at Celtic Park, and then you go back and get her a card and she wants to give you £20 to put to charity. And it's Celtic supporters that go and 
whole dances and the, the funds they make for it, they come and give it to one of the Celtic players, wee girls that's not been keeping well through some uh, ailment that she's got. Uh, it's just an incredible emotional bond that, that all these people have got together and I feel very, very strongly a part of that. And it's for them so much that we want success. And it's trying, it's trying to get the importance of that across to the people that are coming through the club now. That this is a whole, whole way of life. And they've got to be part of that. And they carry all the hopes. And these people love them. They love them so much. They love them so much. And we have got to go and make sure we give them everything we can because they are, without doubt, the, the greatest thing about Celtic Football Club. I think and my hopes are the same as Tommy's, that we must be a contender. We must be seen to be contending at the highest level. It does not mean to say that we expect to win every tournament or expect to win every cup or any given tournament. I think that's unfair. You know, football's a tough game and there's lots of competition. But what we have to show is we've got to... We have the, we have the dedication and the, um, the, the skills that we are at the, the level which uh, we are, we're feared by everyone. I think that's most important to Celtic supporters than actually winning at any given tournament on a given day. Above all else, realise that uh, this is only my chance at it. Uh, when I'm not here, if it's three years, if it's five years, if it's ten years from now, somebody else will be there. Somebody else will be there. And that's it. It's no getting carried away with your own importance and think you're going to be the guy that's going to make everything different and everything better. As long as I can go in at this time in Celtic's history and do my bit to get them by this particular time, and if you're going to be even more successful and more successful, then that'll be great. That'll be great. But as long as when my chance came, I took it and helped to improve Celtic Football Club, I'll be happy with that. I'll be happy with that.